This episode is sponsored by our friends at YCharts. As the year comes to a close, YCharts has you covered with a webinar with friends of the show, Michael Batnick and Ben Carlson, covering trends and insights that define 2023. Prepare for the new year ahead by gaining access to compelling visuals that tell this year's narrative, plus actionable suggestions you can leverage to help elevate your year-end strategy. Click the link in the show notes to register for YCharts webinar and kick off 2024 with more effective client communications. Don't forget, you can get 20% off your initial subscription when you start a free YCharts trial and tell them I sent you new customers only. Jim, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. You know, there is nobody who I've wanted to talk to for a long time, been wanting to get this on the schedule. And you're one of the rare people when you pop up on my podcast feed, I get excited and I do not miss a conversation with you because every time it's something different, there's something new I learn. You get a lot of great charts. So I'm excited. We're going to get into some stuff today. Where do we find you? You find me uh, where I live in Chicago. I'm uh, born and bred uh, Midwesterner, uh, graduated Marquette University in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, spent a bunch of years in uh, New York City working for a bunch of the big brokerage houses. You know, uh, Lehman Brothers was one of them, Credit Suisse, actually it was called First Boston. It was during the merger, but, uh, you know, going back that far. And uh, UBS, Phillips and Drew back in the uh, 80s and into the early 90s. Came back to Chicago, worked for a small brokerage firm, which I'm still affiliated with to this day, called Arbor Research and Trading, spun myself off in 1998 as Bianco Research. And that's what I've been uh, with my own shingle now for 26 years. So uh, I guess it's like the old line about a restaurant, the restaurant on the corner, how's it doing? Well, doors are still open, so it must be doing okay, right? And tell the listeners, Bianco Research, is that targeted towards individuals, advisors, institutions? How's it work? It's targeted towards institutional or professional investors because my affiliated firm, Arbor Research and Trading, it's an institutional bond brokerage firm. So it's more fixed income macro oriented. We don't really have a retail product per se, but I augment that with trying to be active on uh, social media as best I can and being as public as I can to kind of get some of my ideas out there for people that are not into institutional products. All right. Well, Macro, you're speaking right to our audience. Where do we begin? You talk about a lot of things, but what's the macro picture look like here at the end of 2023, getting ready to be Turkey Day? What's the world look like to you? You know, to answer that question, I'd like to back up three years and I'd like to go back to the spring of 2020. The global economy did something extraordinary in the spring of 2020. It completely shut down and then it completely restarted. So we rebooted the economy. And coming out of that reboot, it has not been the same. Now, let me be very clear up front. Not been the same is not dystopian. It is different. And because it is different, it is suffering from imbalances that we had not seen before and we are still struggling with. And those imbalances are leading to frictions, higher inflation, and kind of a review, reassessment of how things work ultimately higher nominal GDP. Now, what are those imbalances? The biggest one I think that we're all familiar with is remote work. Nick Bloom of Stanford University has been studying remote work for 20 years, and now he's the most popular guy on campus because this topic became very interesting. And he liked to say that before the pandemic, maybe about three or 4% of the workforce was remote Remote means, you know, some days that you work not in a central office. Could be five, which would be work from home, or it could be one or two or something. And we were increasing that at about half a percent a year. And then in 2020, we went from four or five percent remote work to 40 percent remote work. And then we backed off of 40 percent to somewhere around 25 to 30 percent of the workforce is remote. And it looks like we're settling in on that number. So I like the way he likes to say it. This was a trend that was underway anyway. We were going to be here in 20 or 30 years, and now we're here now. And we have to try to assimilate into that new trend. Now, the problem with remote work is more and more people are accepting it, but there are some that will not accept it. And those that won't accept it tend to fall in the industries we work in, right? Financial services, big money center commercial banks in Manhattan, Jamie Dimon, 
Dave Solomon of Goldman Sachs. These kind of the leading voices are saying, you lazy bum, get out of the pajamas and get back into the office five days a week. In fact, Goldman Sachs coined the phrase 5-0, meaning get back in the office five days a week. But we all know at Goldman Sachs, that means 7-0. That means in the office every day of the week. That has changed, fundamentally changed the workforce and the labor market in ways I don't think we fully understand. And I'm not going to pretend to you that I understand it. But if you look at labor markets where you see initial claims down in the low 200,000s and you see in continuing claims, you know, in the low one millions, prior to the pandemic, that was considered boom time to see those kind of numbers at these levels. But yet we have these kind of levels and people are assuring me that the recession is six months away. The other one is deglobalization. Globalization probably peaked. There are some think tanks that put out measures of this, probably peaked around the financial crisis in 2008. And we were kind of trailing off of deglobalization. But again, what the pandemic did, what the shutdown restart did was accelerated that trend towards either friend shoring. And the, great, the most recent example of friend shoring is uh, Google is now going to make their Pixel phone in India. They're going to assemble it in India, but a lot of those parts are going to come from China. But they've already said that they're looking with global suppliers to get rid of all of their supply chain out of China, and they hope to do that in the next several years. You know, Apple has been making noise about moving out of China, at least to a friend, a friend showing place like India or Indonesia. And of course, then there's reshoring, where we're bringing stuff back into the United States. Political risk has become so high that, yeah, it's more expensive to make it maybe in Indonesia versus China, maybe it is, or, or definitely in the United States. But when you, when you adjust it for the political risk that you're getting rid of, it makes it worth it. And the last trend that we've seen is energy. And the energy trend that has really been accelerating has been twofold. It's been one, the move towards you know, more green energy, whether it is electric or it's fuel cells or something along those lines. That's one trend. And the other trend is the existing energy producers, and I'm mainly speaking about Russia and Saudi Arabia, are more and more being more aggressive with their energy policy to achieve certain political goals. The voluntary cuts that we've seen from OPEC to try and keep the price of crude oil as high as possible. And we're also seeing that domestically, where we've seen the president use the strategic oil reserve basically as a like a, a lever that he could pull to manipulate the price of gas. It is no longer considered to be a store of oil for an emergency. It's something that's got little levers and dials so we could dial in the proper amount of gas prices that we want before a major national election. So all of these trends have really changed the economy. And that's why I've said it's different. It's not worse. It's not dystopian. And we need to start to adjust to it. And a final thought for you on this. If there's an analogy in history, it is World War II. In September 45, the Japanese surrendered. In October 45, the payroll report had minus 2.1 million jobs. Population adjusted, it's nearly, it's almost identical to what we did in spring of 2020 when we lost 14 million jobs in March of 2020. But the difference was in September 40, October 45, when those 2.1 million jobs were lost, we celebrated it. Those were people that were no longer making tanks and fighters and guns and aircraft carriers because we didn't want or need those things anymore. And from the moment that the surrender took place, everybody said, this is going to change the economy. Let's think about what this post-war economy is going to be. March of 2020, something similar happened. But instead of saying, let's start, maybe we didn't celebrate it, but we could at least say, what is the post-COVID or the post-lockdown economy going to look like? We still have people arguing that there is no post-COVID economy. You heard the when we're recording the week before, Jay Powell gave his press conference six times. He used the phrases rebalance or normalization. We're going back to 2019. Everything's going to be like it was. The inflation rate's going to go to 2%. It's going to, what we're going to find out was it was this blip that happened in 2020 and it affected us in 21 and it's now going away and dust off all the models that used to tell you how the world worked before 2020, they will continue to work again. That's what we mean by rebalance, renormalization. So here we are three years later, and we're still arguing. This would be like if it was 1948, and we're still arguing 
is this a new economy? Do we need to change things or do we just need to hold our breath and just wait for things to come back? And in the meantime, it keeps surprising us with economic statistics, with inflation, volatility in markets. And a final thought for you is the day we're recording, Jay Powell spoke earlier in the day and he gave the opening presentation to a conference that the Fed is hosting. And he basically acknowledged kind of half of what I've said. You know, all these economic uh, models that the Fed uses and Wall Street uses, boy, they've been completely wrong for the last couple of years. And we need to be humble about forecasting the economy. Okay. But then you didn't go to the next step, Jay. Why have they been wrong? What's changed in the last three years? Think about this really hard, Jay. What's changed in the last three years that might have really upset these models to not make them work right? He hasn't quite gone that way, but at least he started on the first part that, yeah, you know, you hear everybody confidently talking about a return to 2% inflation, or there will be a recession in six months, or, um, you know, and that kind of stuff. And it never seems to happen. Well, don't worry, it didn't happen, but it will happen. And he's starting to say, maybe we ought to start to rethink what's going on here with the economy. So that's kind of where I start when I start putting the pieces together of where I think markets are and where I think the economy is. So as we kind of like think about those different moving pieces, deglobalization, et cetera, is there one you think it's like least accepted by the market or people that just say they kind of either aren't aware of or they don't appreciate of kind of these forces, these big kind of tectonic forces moving? Well, I'd say the least accepted of them is probably the change on the viewpoint of energy as kind of a political weapon, that people are not quite there. And one of the reasons why they're not quite there is because the trend in energy, you know, we had a run to $120 crude oil after the Ukraine war started last year, and then that deflated. And, you know, we're still, you know, you know, somewhere in the high 70s right now. So, you know, if you say we're using energy as a political weapon, they immediately they think, oh, it must go to $150. Since oil hasn't gone to $150, so therefore it might not be true. The other one I think that might be accepted but not appreciated, if I could use that uh, nuance, is remote work. So we all know it's here. We all know it's changed things, but we're not sure how. So we kind of then default that it must not be that big a deal. And I'll give you one example of what I've been talking about. Prior to the pandemic, most people were home two days a week, Saturday and Sunday. Now they're home two days a week, Saturday and Sunday, plus probably two days at home and three days in the office. And that most likely for a lot of people is Monday and Friday. But the bigger issue point here is you're home four days a week. You were home too. You've doubled the amount of time that you're at home. What does that mean? Your lifestyle has changed. You demand different things. You demand less of some things, more of other things. Who's been on the leading edge of trying to figure this out is the retailers. The retailers through 22 and into uh, late 21, 22 and into 23, were struggling with inventories. And uh, we shruffed it off as, oh, it's a supply chain problem, it'll get fixed. No, it was a demand change problem that people were trying, to, they were trying to figure out what it was that everybody wanted. And that if they put the things on the shelves in the proportions that they had in 2019, they were having simultaneous gluts and shortages. You may remember some of the big box retailers like the Targets and the Walmarts in 22, if you bought certain items, that they had too much of and you returned them, they would refund you the money and you could take the item home. I don't need more sweatpants to send back to the uh, to the warehouse. I've got way too many of them. So here's your money back for the sweatpants you bought, you don't want, just take them home anyway. And that was, you know, we've never seen that before because they were really trying to understand the post COVID consumer. While it's understood, it may not be appreciated enough. And then the final one is probably reshoring and deglobalization. That one is largely understood, but we're still not quite figuring out what exactly does that mean just yet. Maybe it's filtering itself into bleeding into some of these other ones. My big theory is, you know, labor has got more power over management than any time we've seen in at least a generation. Just look at the strikes that we've had and look at the aggressiveness of just the UAW strike that has recently been settled and the amount of pay increases that they've gotten out of those strikes. Part of that is also coming from a change of attitude about work. And it also might be that there is a shortage of workers because of reshoring, 
and that we need more manufacturing workers and we don't have as many people that want to work in that area. So people like the UAW have newfound power that they haven't had for the last generation or so. So as, as the people start to think about these macro forces at play, you know, I think the main, in my mind, I mean, everyone's always talking about equities, but the main thing that's been going on the past few years, like the cocktail party discussion has, in my mind, it, it was inflation. And that's kind of, in my mind, receding a little bit to this 5% T-bill number, right? Like, you know, this ability to get income when you haven't been able to from the government in, in a really long time. Talk to us a little bit about those kind of competing forces and kind of where, because you're definitely a fixed income guy. So I uh, would love to hear a little bit about, I actually said on Twitter the other day, I said, you know, it's strange to me that people aren't losing their minds more about an asset going down as much as fixed income has. Because like if stocks were down like 50, like the long bond, people would be losing their absolute mind on social media and elsewhere. And I said, why is that? Like, I'm like, why are people not, you know, think about it. Anyway, kick it over to you. What do you think? Let me start with the big picture first and then get into that why they're not losing their mind. I've got some thoughts on that too. You're right. I do think that the center of the universe is right now interest rates. And the week before we were recording, you know, was the week when we saw the 5% move up in the stock market, the S&P, and we saw the 50 basis point decline in the 10-year uh, yield uh, that really just turned all these trends around. It's important to note that that all started on October 31st. Now, before October 31st, we had almost 280 reports put out by the S&P 500 companies, a little more than half. In sum, they were great. They beat big, they beat broad, they gave good guidance. And the stock market kept going down and going down and going down and closed at a 10% correction on October 28th, the Friday before the 31st. So it had pretty much ignored all those numbers. And then what happened last week that got everything juiced? Interest rates fell. So if you're an equity guy, I could either give you 300 decent earnings reports or I could give you a 20 or 25 basis point drop in interest rates. And that 20 or 25 basis point drops in interest rates is going to get a response out of the broad measure of stocks more than the collective of all of those earnings reports, because it's all about interest rates right now. Why is it all about interest rates? Dr. Jeremy Siegel just updated his famous book, Stocks for the Wrong Run. There's a new edition out this year. And I'll summarize. In the book, what is the long run potential for the stock market, adjusting for the level of PEs like the CAPE ratio and the level of inflation and the economic outlook and stuff? And he says, given all of that, it's about 8% a year. Now, that doesn't mean 8% every year, because for the last two years, the S&P's returned you zero. Well, that means that you know in the year and a half or two years before that, it returned you way more than 8%. So over long cycles, you should get about an 8% return. And that's pretty close to University of Chicago studies. They came up with, a, you know, back in the 80s and 90s, they did a similar study and they came up with 9%. Close enough for government work, 8 9%. Well, in 2019, if you would have said to people, look, the long-term return of the stock market is 8-ish percent, plus or minus 100 basis points. What's your alternative? There's a money market fund here yielding 13 basis points. There's a 10-year yielding here, you know, 2%. So we coined the phrase, Tina, there is no alternative. And everybody had to pile into equities because that was the only place you were going to make money. 2023, now there's an all-money market fund that's yielding you five. There's a bond fund that's yielding you four and a half. Let's stick with money market funds. Now you can get two-thirds of that long-term return with no market risk by putting your money in a money market fund. Is moving into the risk of equities worth that final third is really the question. In other words, there is an alternative. This is why I think the stock market responds so violently to interest rates either going up or going down because it is now serious competition. There are people that are saying, look, take your SPYs and your VOOs. I don't want them. I'm going to stick in a money market fund. And guess what? I've done better than SPY and VOO for the last two years, and I'm still getting five out of that thing. So unless you want to make me a solid case 
that the stock market's got 15, 20% years coming ahead and that I'm going to miss out on something huge, mind you, where we are in valuations, where the valuations would have to be in order for those in, uh, for the for that kind of earnings to come through. I'm fine staying in a money market fund or in bond funds. And you've seen that with the flows starting to move up and down. So it's definitely changed the dynamic in the market that there is competition now that you cannot scream at somebody like you could in 2019. If you're going to stay in a 13 basis point money market fund, you're going to make the biggest mistake of your life. You can't really say that to somebody if they're getting 510 in a money market fund today. And that for the last two years, the stock market has not given them much and did the two years before that. So there is no mean reversion necessarily coming to the upside as well. Finally, about people losing their mind about bonds. Yeah, it's been a real shocker. The statistics show, if you look at of the thousands of ETFs, what has gotten the biggest inflow of the year? VOO. VOO is the Vanguard S&P 500. Vanguard markets that towards pension plans and 401k. It's exactly the same as SPY, but SPY is a trader tool. That one is more of an, uh, of an allocator tool. Number two is TLT, is the iShares 20-year treasury. That thing is down, as you pointed out. Well, actually, TLT is down about 45% off of its high. It's down over 10% this year. It has gotten, in the last two years, nearly $50 billion of money. And I've jokingly called it an efficient money incineration machine because money goes into something that's gone down by half. It's never seen flows like this. And it almost gets incinerated almost instantly until 10 days ago, you know, that they finally started to get some relief from it 10 days ago. But it never stopped. It just kept coming and coming. And I think what has happened is people have forgotten the difference between total return and yield. They see yield. Oh my God, look at these yields. I got to get these yields. Well, there's this other part of the equation called total return. You might like the yield that TLT is throwing off versus a couple of years ago, but the price keeps going down and keeps offsetting that yield. So they're really not learning total return. And that's why I've been vocal, especially on social media, pointing out that all of the surveys in the bond market have been extraordinarily bullish, even though the prices until 10 days ago were just getting pummeled. There's going to be recession. There's going to be no inflation. There's going to be an accident in the market. Interest rates are crushingly too high. We have to be long duration. That's the mar uh, the bond market's part term. And because if we're long duration, there's going to be a gigantic rally. Been waiting over a year for that rally. They've been getting crushed for the last year, the last 10 days. See, I told you we we're going to have a rally. Yeah, well, you've still got a long ways to go before you get back to break even on this. And while I do think the market will continue to rally a little bit more, I still think the trend in yields is higher. It's been higher since August of 2020. I think we're in the 40 year bull market in bonds ended in August 2020. And I think we're in year four of a multi year bear market in bonds. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot wrapped in there. I mean, I think that the first thing, I, the more I think about it, I think that investors, and this isn't everyone, but I feel like it's most individuals and a lot of advisors and professionals, you know, they really only think in, of bonds in terms of yield. Like they don't even think of the price at all. So I would be surprised if many even knew that their bond investments were down 10, 20, 50%. I think they would just say, oh, my yields are now 5%, amazing. They also then fall into the, idea too that, well, it's a government security, so it'll never default. It has no credit risk. That's technically true. If you bought a treasury security, there's a maturity date on the end. But if you buy an ETF or a mutual fund of government bonds, there is no maturity date where you will get back par at the end. So that price can go down and it can stay down if interest rates are higher. And I think that that part is also people struggle with too. Why do you think that so you mentioned sort of the Tina trade. Why hasn't this, and maybe yet, caused anything to break in other areas like with equities? I mean, equities, everyone talks about the Magnificent Seven or whatever the acronym is now. Mag Seven, if you want to be one of the cool kids. Why hasn't this caused more problems? Is it flow related? Is it 
actually that the market cap is just being held up by this small group? Is it inevitable or is there something we got this 50% GDP growth coming due to this AI revolution? Why, why have things been so resilient and kind of where should we be looking for some of the cracks if there are any and where might they be? I'm going to answer the question in two ways. If you look at the stock market, the MAG7 stocks have a nine plus trillion dollar market cap somewhere in there, depending on what day you measure it. If you take them out of the equation, I think the S&P 493, the last time I updated it, so last Friday, is up like 2% year to date. Now you can get nearly three and a half to four year to date running total so far if you had been in bills. So you're underperforming cash. Mid cap stocks are about break even. The Russell 2000 is down on the year slightly. The Russell micro cap, which is the bottom half of the Russell 2000 small cap index, is still down about 8% on the year. So you take those seven stocks out, the rest of the stock market isn't doing much of anything. I've even gone as far as I put together a calculation of the Russell 3000 less the MAG7. So the 2,993 was down on the year as of one week ago. Now it's up, but all that gain came in the last four or five trading days. And here we are, you know, practically in the middle of November. So the stock market, I think, is signaling that things are not as great as we think they are. I think it's largely because of the competition that that money goes either into AI stocks or some version of some kind of AI play. Maybe it's ARK again or something along those. Maybe it's not ARK, but something along those play. And then after that, I'd rather hold 5% money market funds or I'd rather play in something that has a little bit less risk. So when you ask me why is something break, I would say the market is kind of signaling that when you take those seven stocks out because they've got a different narrative than the rest of the market. How about the economy? Why isn't anything broken in the economy? And boy, we've been through this now for the last year and a half, right? 25% correction in stocks last year. That's going to break something. Then we had the liability-driven investing crisis in the UK with 30-year gilts. That's going to break something. Then we had the banking crisis. That's going to break something. And it never really seems to break something. Now, the new thing that we have that's going to break something is punishingly high interest rates. Jonathan Gray, who's the CEO of Blackstone, reported their numbers about two, three weeks ago, and they didn't have a good quarter. And then he said, yeah, look, we didn't have a good quarter. And then he went on this diatribe about higher interest rates and 8% mortgages is going to kill everything. I love the guys at Blackstone. I, I truly do. But he sounded like somebody was complaining that my business model is built on free money. And when you take my free money away, my business model really struggles. And there's this belief that interest rates have gone up so much that we're going to break something. This is what I think undergrids this whole idea that the recession is six months away. Now, where I push back on that is the way I like to frame it is that the market has an anchoring problem. The mistake, the distortion in interest rates was 2009 to 2020, the QE period when we pushed rates down to zero, and that wasn't even good enough for Europe and Japan. We pushed them negative. That was the distortion. What you're seeing now at 8% mortgages, 5% or recently 5% in the 10-year treasury and the 30-year treasury is normal. That's returning to normal. And so we look at this and you hear this all the time, real rates, which are inflation adjusted interest rates are at 15 year highs. This is punishing the economy. You're thinking that 2018 was normal or 2019 was normal when we were in the middle of QE. That was the abnormal period. So hundreds of basis points of that rise was just to get off the distortion of 2009 to 2020. Besides, we're not in QE anymore quantitative easing. We're in quantitative tightening right now. So if hundreds of those basis points rise in interest rates was just to get off the distortion, what I've been postulating is the amount of restrictiveness we have in interest rates today leaning on the economy is not that great. There is restrictiveness. I think we are above what we would refer to as fair value, but not nearly to the extent that everybody thinks and that's why the economy keeps shaking off these numbers. Even the housing market keeps shaking off these numbers. The housing market is being hurt by higher interest rates. But if you would have asked people in a vacuum 18 months ago, what's going to happen to the housing market when mortgages get to 8%, we would have thought you know, it would have been the third level of hell. It's not that bad. It's definitely been hit 
but it's not been devastated by it. And so I think that what we're starting to realize is these rates are really not biting as much as everybody thinks. And that's why I got very concerned when Jay Powell said, you know, well, the market's going to do the work for me by raising interest rates, so we don't have to raise rates at the Fed. And I'll give you one quick uh, analogy. I said, careful in that, Jay. I'm not trying to argue for, you know, top-down control by the Federal Reserve of interest rates, but that was the argument a year ago, as I mentioned a second ago, with liability-driven investing in the UK. Back in September of last year, Liz Trust was the prime minister of the UK. She put out a mini budget. Mini budget is what the word implies. It cut taxes, it increased spending, it increased the deficit. The UK gilt market, their bond market, didn't like it. Turn it. And so everybody asked everybody in parliament, what do you think of the budget? Oh, I got this problem, that problem, but it'll pass. The bond market didn't want it to pass. So the bond market did the work of parliament. It took UK gilt yields up 150 basis points in like eight days. The Bank of England's got 300 years of data. That's never happened before. It threw their economy into turmoil. It threw their markets into turmoil. Liz Trust didn't last as long as a head of lettuce. She was out after 44 days as prime minister. Rishi Sunak came in. The mini budget was dead. And they're still trying to pick up the pieces from that whole debacle from a year ago. That's what happens when the market does the work for you. So if I'm right, and that interest rates are not nearly as restrictive as we think they are, and we get to a point where people say, you know what, this economy's going hot, the inflation rate might be bottoming at something well above two, might be creeping back towards four. I'm not talking Zimbabwe here. I'm talking about creeping back towards four. Interest rates have to go higher to slow things down. But don't worry, the market's going to do it for us. Well, watch the market say, hold my beer. You want me to slow this economy? I'll slow this economy. Just like in the UK a year ago. You want me to kill this mini budget? Hold my beer and watch me kill this mini budget. And that's kind of the way that markets work. And that's why I'm a little bit worried that somewhere down the line, you're going to rue the day that you said, I'm going to just let the market kind of do it for me. Because it will. It will. You just won't like what the way it's going to do it. As we think about that and we look out towards next year, like what sort of indicators you uh, always have great charts? What are some of the charts that you're thinking about or indicators? I mean, the one we were tweeting about the other day where we were talking about tips, which now have a yield that they haven't had in a long time. And I was trying to think conceptually because I was like, you know, all right, T-bills are at five. And I wonder at what interest rate on T-bills investors hit that point where they're like, I don't want stocks anymore. And is that, you know, three, five, seven, ten? I think it is five. I think people don't really understand tips, but I did a poll where I was like, at what tips yield would you, you know, sell your stocks? And it was like three, five, seven, never, you know, and we're not even at three, but it's funny to see people large amount was at like seven or never, I think, you know, which is if that ever happens. I don't know what the world would look like. But the point being is that you have this cult of equities at any price, no matter what, that I feel like there might be some crumbles in it or cracks in it with T-bills at five. But anyway, you talk about tips or talk about other stuff you're looking at. Feel free to take it which way you want. Yeah. So let me take a little quick uh, comment about tip securities. What we're talking about with real yields is a tip security. They were first issued in 1997. These are government issued bonds. And what they do, I'm kind of explaining this for people that are not familiar with them. What you do, you buy $100 worth of these bonds and the yield on them is about 2.4%. Well, that doesn't sound like much, except they also give you the inflation rate. So if the inflation rate, to keep the example simple, is 4%, in a year, you will be accreted more bonds. So if you bought $100 worth of bonds and the inflation rate is 4%, in a year, you'll have $104 worth of bonds and you'll still have your 2.4% yield. Accretion, I used to think you'd have to go to the doctor to see somebody about it, but you also get it in the bond market as well, too. That's like the simplest descriptions of tips I've ever heard. I, I feel like everyone, when they start talking about tips, people's eyes just roll back. But it's an incredible security or an offering for investors anyway. And so I spent a lot of time looking at tips. And I didn't see your poll, but I will say this about the people that say, you know, seven or never. If you go back in history and say, 
I can buy a security that is going to give me the inflation rate plus 7%. I don't believe there's ever been a time that the stock market has outperformed that. That is a guarantee outperform of the stock market, at least based on historical perspectives. Well, the historical global real return of stocks is five. You know, I mean, in the US, it's been higher real return after inflation. It's been like six and a half, but, but five has been equities. A lot of those returns are also the low inflation period of like, you know, 1999 to like 2020. If you go back and you look at the real rates of returns of the stock market in the inflationary periods, like the 70s, 80s, and into the early 90s and stuff, those returns are a little bit lower. But the point is, you're right. The point is, is if you could get a 7% real yield on a security with no credit risk that's guaranteed by the government, if you're at the poker table, you're betting that the stock market's going to pull an inside straight to beat that. And that's really tough to do. You should take that with both hands. And so you're right, there's this equities or nothing kind of mentality because that's the way it's been for the last 20 years. It's been this equities or nothing mentality. This is a couple of years ago, but we said, you know, we're talking about valuations and we love talking about Cape Ratio, but I said, you know, at, at what point would you sell your stocks? And I said, you know, do you hold stocks currently? It's like 99% said yes. Would you sell them if they hit a P ratio of 50, you know, which is higher than they've ever been in history? And I think it was over half said, no, they wouldn't sell them. And then I said, what if they hit 100, you know? And then I think it was like still a third said, no, we won't sell these. Like, no matter what, you cannot take my stocks away from me. So there's a whole cohort, but you know, sentiment tracks price, right? So if we did this poll in 2009, probably a totally different, <laughs> totally different response. Exactly. And not only was sentiment track price, it also, you know, tracks the way you've gotten performance. Because let me throw my little spin on that too. We're as you were asking people stocks. So they think SPY. When would I ever sell SPY? And the answer is never because SPY always goes up. It always outperforms everything. I think that's a recent phenomenon that started in the late 90s and ran through about 2020. Now, before the 90s, that was the era, I mean, before the night, you know, the mid 1990s and the invention of the ETF, that was the era of Peter Lynch. That was the era of stock picking. That was a completely different era that people not only didn't we have SPY, people didn't think or professional managers didn't know what the utility of such a thing would be. My job is to pick stocks. It is not to buy the broad index. I actually think coming out of this 2020, uh, you know, the biggest economic event and the, the acceleration of trends and that the economy is out of balance and it needs to be put back into balance. I think we're going to go back to a stock picking world. And I think that the MAG7 stocks versus everything else is the first salvo of many of those salvos. And that if you want to get superior returns in the stock market, it's not going to be press the bet on SPY or triple Qs. It's going to be picking the stock in the sectors that are going to work the best. Now, I say that and people say, oh, of course, of course, I, I will do that. I do that. No, we've got a whole generation of professional managers that are not stock pickers. They were, if you were a stock picker, you got washed out of this business because you got pushed into the index and sector betting because of the way that the ETF market has completely changed the structure of it. And if you are even to stock picking, you're thinking, yes, I'll have to think between whether I want software or cloud computing or whether I want microprocessors or something like that. No, it's not just which sector of tech. It might be industrials versus healthcare versus consumer discretionary versus basic materials. What are all those sectors? Those are all the those are all the rounding errors that are left in the S&P, SPY that I never really thought about. Those sectors are going to kind of have their rotations in and out. It look it'll be look a lot more like the Peter Lynch era, I think, going forward than not. Now I know Mike Green of Simplify Asset Management you know, pushes back on this argument. And he's got, and the reason I brought him up by name is he's got very good arguments against this because of the tremendous amount of flows that goes into passive investing and that it will force the rising tide to lift all of the boats. I get that. I get that. And that he might not be wrong on that. But I do think we are going to see when you say with the surveys, 
you know, what about the stock market? When would you sell the stock market? How much should you be in stocks? We're not yet at the point where we're asking, which stocks should you buy? When would you sell your disclaimer discretionary stocks? What level would you be acquiring energy stocks? You know, those types of questions. We're not there. We're still thinking of this as a broad SPY kind of world. I hear Mike's argument, but to me, it's always like when you have the sentiment, the price, the valuations, the flows, all kind of end up in the same place. And so nothing changes sentiment like price. And so things start to go down or underperform. That style of flows can be flighting. It's been stable and robust for a long time, but as we've seen in many, many other countries in the world, I mean, if you look at China, if you look at Japan, I mean, on and on and on, just this just boom bust. I mean, look, even the US wasn't that long ago, GFC and 2000 bear markets. It feels like a lifetime ago, but certainly within my lifetime of investing. So not even the prior century, <laughs> but in the last 20 well, years. So I think the one big thing you had going for what we had going for the market, SPY was invented in like 93 or 94. And then, you know, the, the boom kind of followed around 2000 with ETFs and just kept going from there. And that is, you know, the broad based investing themes that you could just buy thematic ideas through ETFs is, you know, you had, I think that 87 really, when Greenspan came out the morning after the stock market crash and gave that one sentence statement that we stand ready, willing to provide all liquidity as necessary to the financial institutions and that the stock market completely turned around. I remember that 87. I was you know, working at Lehman Brothers at the time. And I remember the 20th of October. And individually, after the stock market crashed in the 19th and the 20th, it tried to rebound and it went back down below the 19th low. And the specialist system started closing one stock after another after another. And we got to about 90 or 100 stocks in the S&P 500 that stopped trading in the middle of the day. And there was a real concern, a real concern that we were inches away from the entire financial system collapsing. And then Greenspan comes out with that statement that the Fed's ready to flood the system with money and boom, everything turned around. And since that day, we've always responded with whenever there's a wobble in the markets, the Fed, the FSOC, which is the Financial Stability Oversight Council or the Plunge Protection Team, if you want to call them that, or the Treasury or all of the above is ready to throw money at whatever they need to, to stop whatever unpleasantries are coming. The last example of that was COVID, when the Fed was buying $100 billion of Treasuries a day in March of 2020 to try and arrest the decline in markets. From 87 to 2020, the thing that allowed all of that to happen was we were in a non-inflationary world and maybe even in a deflationary world. But if we are changing to an inflationary world, now we're in a world where when the shit hits the fan and the Fed cuts rates, they go to two and they're done. And if, we, if two doesn't fix it, they can't go much beyond that. Maybe they go to even the three and they're done. They're not going back to zero in printing uh, gobs and gobs of money because we'll wind up with nine or 10% inflation again if we are in this different type of world. If that's the case, and if that you know, backstop that's been there for 35 years is no longer there, then this whole idea that I, I go to the HR department and I check off, take off a, a bunch of my monthly money and stick it 50% in the Vanguard S&P 500 fund and 50% in the Vanguard bond fund, and then I forget I did that five years ago and it just keeps accumulating and accumulating, eventually people are going to wake up and go, man, I better change that. I better start rethinking that. And then that constant flow might start to change. Now, we're not there yet, but I think we're a lot closer to that apex or that shifting point than we've ever been since the invention of the ETF. We've kind of discussed some areas of warning or cracks that we're seeing. What are there opportunities, like as you look around the entire global set in this sort of world, what looks good, if anything, or potentially good, what's on your mind? Well, I think that in some respects that the bond market is providing new opportunities now for people, for you know a fixed income market. Not only can you get two thirds of the returns in the stock market because of the high yields, with the flat and slightly inverted curve, and it's been that way for a year and a, a year, maybe not quite a year and a half, it was July of last year when 
two tens inverted. You've got this opportunity that with the bond market, there's two things to keep in mind. One, I can always run back into 5% money market funds. I can always run out of 5% money market funds into longer duration whenever I think there's an opportunity in longer duration. And so you're going to get paid either way. You'll get dinged when you make a mistake. Keep in mind this about bonds. Whenever I talk about active bond management, people automatically default and think, well, no one could beat the index because they think of the S&P and they think that over long terms, 90 to 95% of bond manage, I mean, excuse me, of stock managers cannot be their benchmark. And that's been measurably uh, shown over time by the SPIVA report, the S&P and active investment universe shows that. But in fixed income, the numbers that can beat the benchmark index are more like 50-50. So about half the managers in fixed income can outperform the index and have outperformed the index. That's why suddenly in the bond market, we don't measure people against the index, we measure people against their peers because we automatically assume half the universe can beat the index to begin with. So index beating or index active management to outperform an index in the bond market has a big structural advantage over active management in the equity market. So active bond management, I think, has an opportunity set for it right now that you've got yield, you've got potentials for return, and if everything looks bad, you can sit it out with a 5% yield in cash before you move back in. So that's the big asset class I think that people are starting to shift towards. They're just not sure how they're supposed to do it. Do I buy AGG or BND, which are the big bond indices? Or do I buy TLT, but that's got too much risk? Or do I just park it in a money market fund or a short-term treasury ETF? How do I kind of move back and forth? And the move back and forth, what you're seeing is, Actively managed fixed income ETFs have been one of the fastest growing categories this year. PIMCO's brought out one, BlackRock's brought out one. There's, they're, they're coming out left and right because it's an area that I think has got some real opportunity. Now, that's kind of like if you're you know bigger picture professional, but if you're an investor, I would say there's plenty of opportunity if you shift away from, you know, do I buy a SPY up or down, you know, QQQ up or down, TLT up or down? If you want to start thinking about sectors or stocks, thematic ideas like, well, MAG7 was the big one this year, but there will be other ones as well. Shipping was a big one in 21 and 22. In fact, at some point through from late 20 to the middle of 22, the shipping stocks actually outperformed Bitcoin in a bull market. In its bull market, it outperformed Bitcoin, that those, those companies have done so much better. This year, you know, home builders. Home builders did great this year. They actually outperformed the MAG7 until very recent, like in the last few weeks. Even though we've had higher interest rates, we've seen a tremendous move into the home builders. So those types of ideas, you know, can come back and they could come back in a big way, I think, when we look at this market. And so what does it mean for reshoring? What does it mean for work from home? Who's got this figured out? And how do I take advantage of these ideas? So it's going back to like stock by stock, sector by sector kind of ideas. And I think some people are starting to get a good handle on that. But it's like I said, this is not like 1945, where we knew day one, we got to start thinking that way. It's taken us three years to kind of get our bearings to start to think in those terms that this is permanent, what's happening with the economy and different, it's not dystopian, and how are we going to play this thing out as we move forward? So, I mean, so those are kind of the answers that I've been giving. You'll notice I'm being a little bit evasive because I'm still struggling myself trying to figure out what are the themes that I should be playing for the new economy. What I figured out is it isn't just SPY up, down, QQQ up, down. I think that those will always provide trading opportunities, but that late 90s to 2020 period for that, I think, is over. And we're now shifting into a new cycle. We definitely see it. Some things you're talking about, the, some of the home builders have bubbled up as some of our biggest holdings on the domestic stock space. We haven't talked that much about foreign equities. Is that an area that you see opportunity? Is it very specific to certain countries as we talk about some of these trends? You know, we've long discussed this, you know, foreign underperformance relative to U.S., but also within the U.S., small caps, which we talked about earlier. 
foreign markets, are they interesting to you? Not so much. What's going on? They are interesting. The biggest problem foreign markets have, of course, is that they don't have a mag seven. They have missed out on the mega cap tech sector. So if you actually looked at the US markets versus foreign markets, removing the mega cap tech sector, the performances have been fairly similar, but you really can't remove it. You know, you can't pretend that Apple never existed in the United States or that Microsoft or, uh, is never existed or Amazon never existed. They did. And they added trillions of dollars of wealth in the United States. So as far as, as, far as the foreign markets go, I do think that because of this reshoring, onshoring, they're very different cycles. Chinese market, to start with one of the more popular ones everybody asks about, I think is in a world of hurt. At the beginning of the year in January, the Bank of America Global Fund Manager Survey asked the outlook for China. They've asked that question for 21 years. The outlook for China in January never been more positive than it was at the beginning of the year. Why? Because they just ended zero COVID. And a billion people literally were supposed to be leaving their homes. They were going to unweld the door. If you knew anything about zero COVID in China, everybody lives in an apartment or most people live in an apartment and they literally welded the front door shut and they wouldn't let you out because of zero COVID. So they were going to let them out. They were going to go back to work. They were going to go spend money. They were going to start traveling. There was going to be this big boom in the Chinese economy. Everybody was bullish. Nothing of the sort happened. It was a big thud. Their stock market has fallen out of bed. It was down 8% on the year, you know, as of last week, the last time that I looked at it. It's really been struggling. And the Chinese have been in such a funk to try and figure out how to fix it. They, they've reverted back to, let's throw all the short sellers in jail and let's start a government fund to basically buy stocks to prop them up. That's the key. That's the sign they're out of ideas. When your last idea is, we'll just throw the short seller, and they literally do in China, let's just throw the short sellers in jail is your idea to try and get your stock market to go up. You know you're in trouble. So their market, I think, is in a world of hurt right now. And it's probably going to stay that way for a while. Japanese stock market, on the other hand, looks a little bit more enticing. It has been beaten up for over a generation. Some of those stocks have extraordinary values. And most interestingly, while the Chinese economy didn't show the, a pulse of life, the Japanese economy finally is. Hey, they finally got 2% inflation. They finally got real growth. Something that they've been trying to get for like 15 years or 20 years, get some kind of a growth impulse out of their economy. They finally have it. And their biggest problem they're facing right now is they're trying to hold back their interest rates from going up through yield curve control. And they're not able to really hold it back as much as they can. So a lot of those cheap stocks you know, might be might show some real value. Europe, Europe is a different story altogether. They seem to be all over the place. In other words, what I mean by all over the place is they're where I think we're going. They don't have in Europe a strong index ETF. Everybody just buy the French stock market or the German stock market and forget it. It always goes up and it always outperforms everybody. That doesn't exist in Europe to the degree. It, there's some of it, but not to the degree that it does in the United States. So it's certain sectors go up, certain sectors go down. Banking system is really struggling in Europe as for one sector. And that churn that you see is they're back to stock picking in Europe. And that's ultimately where I think we might be going. They don't always lead us, but I think they're leading us in that respect. So that's the problem is that it's the 2020 mentality. Do I buy the MSCI World Index or don't I buy the World Index? Well, this isn't that kind of world anymore. And it isn't even, do I buy the French market or the German market? I don't even think it's that anymore. I mean, it might be just, do I buy the German industrials or do I sell the French consumer discretionaries? It's that kind of a world that we're in. We have a piece, I don't think we published it, it'd probably be out by the time we write this, where we say it's less about where and more about the what. You know, it's like what these stocks are. That's always been true, of course. But I feel like in an increasing world where borders are meaningless, it's particularly what are you investing in rather than where. Any charts that you're looking at currently right now, or it could be models where these are like really interesting or something that's on your brain that you're thinking about as kind of we end 2023 into 2024. You know, for me, it's kind of the tips yield. But is there any other charts where you're like, you know, this one is just like flashing in my face, whatever it is, or something that I'm confused or excited about, or it's not well discussed? I'm going to go back to, you know, being the purely macro guy, and I'm going to give you a, a couple of ideas. 
I have a Bloomberg and the Bloomberg Professional Service is, is wonderful. And one of the things that Bloomberg does is they survey about 70 economists continuously. What's your forecast for GDP? What's your forecast for inflation? What's your forecast for this or that? And it just it gets updated as the 70 odd Wall Street economists update their surveys. And I chart that regularly. And there's been a repeating pattern for the last 15 months in this. And that has been when you ask economists, what is the outlook for the economy in six months? It's contraction. It's recession. But then six months later, when you get there, it's three or four percent growth. It just, you know, they kind of constantly have to they kind of start off with the economy's going to suck in six months. And then they spend the next five months constantly upgrading that forecast is what they wind up doing. That's not always been the case that though. It has been. So I'm looking for that pattern through yesterday when I was last looking at those charts continues. I'm looking to see at the end of the year, does that pattern change? Does the second quarter of 24 do the economists just say, forget the recession story, just we'll start with good growth for the second quarter of 24, and then maybe we see them revise it the other way. Do they capitulate to this idea that there won't be a recession? So that would be kind of what I'm looking for right now is as long as we constantly start off with in six months, things will be terrible, and then we wind up having to constantly upgrade it. We're going to continue to see, I think, upward pressure on interest rates. I know we don't have it in the last two weeks because the economy is not underperforming. It's not dragging things down. On the inflation side, I'm going to go a little different because this is something I've been looking at just in the last couple of days. If you look at goods inflation stuff, you know, you know, and the inflation statistics can be broken down. Let me start off with into two categories, stuff, things and services. And what we've been seeing is stickiness, you know, or that's the phrase we like to use of services inflation. It's been staying sticky. It's been, you know, four or five percent and it hasn't been really coming down just yet. And people predict it will, but it hasn't. Stuff has come down, but stuff looks like it's bottoming. I'm not going to say it's going up. It's just maybe stopped going down. Now I look over and the New York Fed has this measure of supply chain stress. It's measured as a Z-score, which is number of standard deviations off a long-term average of a very measure of metrics that measure the supply chain. It's at the lowest level it's ever been. And I do know when you look at the supply chain, it tends to be very mean reverting. So if we're at the lowest measure of the supply chain right now, Inflation stuff should be imploding on itself. It's not. It's down and it seems to be bottoming. If there is that mean reversion in the supply chain that it's going to start getting tighter and it's going to get more expensive to ship stuff, that will put upward pressure on stuff. And that's why I'm still in the camp that inflation is going to be problematic. It's going to be three, four percent problematic, as I like to joke, not eight, ten Zimbabwe problematic. Why does that matter? What is the, and this is the third chart I've been watching a lot. What is the proper level of interest rates for a country? Should it be 200%? Should it be zero? Should it be eight, five? Where, where should they be? Start with their nominal GDP growth. Nominal GDP growth is their inflation rate plus their real growth rate. Why does Venezuela have well over 100% inflation? Because it has well over 100% inflation, uh, uh, well over 100% interest rates because it has well over 100% inflation. And that's one half of the equation. And then you throw in, even if you throw in a contraction in real growth, you would come up with sky high interest rates. Why did until a year ago, Japan always have zero in interest rates? Because the combination of their inflation rate and the real growth, their nominal GDP came out to zero growth. So zero, and that's why their interest rates were there. Well, if our inflation rate is going to stay sticky at three-ish, you know, maybe high twos, maybe high threes, not two. And we're going to continue to churn out two and a half percent inflation, not four nine like we just did, but you know, two, two and a half percent. That gives you a nominal growth rate in the five to six percent range. So that's the other chart I've been looking at. And I'm saying, look, if nominal growth is going to stay in five to six percent, then long-term interest rates should start to approximate nominal growth. They're four and a half. 
they're not quite there at that 5 or 6% range, so they've got a little bit higher to go. Does that matter? If you are looking at 8% returns in stocks, and you're looking at now 5.5% or 6%, two-thirds to three-quarters of the stock market's long-term potential with no market risk in our no credit risk, no market risk, you know, government bonds, that does tend to be a more drag on the economy. The reason I say it that way is when I say, look, the economy is going to continue to churn out, you know, or churn out positive numbers, or as the parlance we like to use in 23 is, I'm in the no, the no landing camp. The economy just keeps going. It doesn't slow down into a soft landing or a hard landing. And if I'm in the no landing camp, doesn't that mean that earnings are going to come through? Doesn't that mean it's bullish for stocks? Except for the competition that higher interest rates will bring to it. And as I mentioned earlier, you can give me 300 decent earnings reports, but give me a 20% decline in interest rates and the stock market will react to interest rates more than 300 earnings reports. So if the economy stays decent, if inflation is bottoming at three, and that puts upward pressure on interest rates, that means risk markets, especially like the stock market, are going to have to deal with serious competition from the bond market. It did in the 80s and 90s, but you know we, it's been a long time since we've seen this type of environment, and we're going to have to get used to it. And so your surveys where people, well, stocks forever, stocks at any price, that mentality worked when interest rates were at zero from 2009 to 2020. But I don't think that mentality is or is going to apply in this post-COVID cycle as we move forward. It's going to take some time for people to kind of figure this out. Yeah, I mean, it's not just the competing asset part from my mind, too. It's that if you model the historical, this is true not just in the U.S., but everywhere, historical multiples people are willing to pay on stocks when inflation is north and it gets worse the higher you go, but certainly above three or four, it's a long way down from here. It's it's like half of where we are today. And so just that re-rating alone, and it doesn't often play out in one month or one year. It usually plays out over an extended period, but it certainly can be a headwind for the multiple. I don't think people are mentally prepared for interest rates. The 10-year hit 6% or inflation starts creeping back up. I feel like that would be a surprise for many that are not, not ready for. To put a point on it, I think what they're not ready for is if interest rates hit 6%, they're of the belief that we're going to have a depression. We're going to have an interest rate driven collapse of housing. The economy will implode on itself because of those higher rates. But what they're not prepared for is we get to six and the sun comes out and everything kind of, it's not, you know, it's, it's a burden. It's a, I'm not saying it's not a burden. It's a burden, meaning it's above fair value. But things survive and they keep going. In other words, we can handle six. So there's no reason for them to come down. And that's what I think they're not ready for. As we start to wind down, a few more questions. But um, anything we haven't talked about today where that's on your mind that you're worried, excited about, crypto? Yeah, let me make a couple of mark remarks about crypto. I've been a big crypto fan. I like to use the word fan as opposed to bull, because I'm not a number go up guy. I mean, obviously, I think the number is going to go up over a long period of time. What I've been is a big fan of decentralized finance or DeFi. And I think what DeFi has the potential of is remaking the financial system into something new, something more efficient, something where in my electronic wallet, I can own my assets. They cannot be subject to burdensome regulation or any of the other things that they're subject to now. And there was a story two days ago in the New York Times that there's been this, um, there's been this wave of bank account closures. Let me back up. In the wake of the Patriot Act and a bunch of other things, there's this thing called a suspicious incident report. I think an SIR, if I've got that right, where banks will report if you engage in some kind of suspicious activity in your bank account, you take out more than $10,000 cash. They report to the Federal Reserve a suspicious incident. You took out more than $10,000 cash. No one ever asks you why you did it. You might have a perfectly legitimate reason to do it. 
or you spend your money on something that looks suspicious. And we're up to now banks reporting up to 3 million suspicious activities a year. Maybe a foreign transaction would be an example of that. What the New York Times report stood was that more and more banks are now summarily telling companies and people, your account is closed. Here's a check for all of the money in your account, a paper check mailed to you. We're done with you. And you've got credit cards, you've got bills, you've got automatic payment, all that stuff gets thrown you know, up in the air and your life gets turned upside down. And it's worse if you're a company. I got a payroll to meet and I've got money in the bank to send to my payroll processing company. And you just sent me a paper check for all my money. I got to pay my payroll tomorrow. How am I supposed to do that? And so it's creating havoc all over the place. And when the New York Times went in to look at this and they started asking banks about why it happens and what is the decision to closing these accounts, no one has a good explanation or they don't want to give it to them. This is where crypto DeFi comes in to try and alleviate some of these concerns. And I've been a big fan of that. My big disappointment is while I see the potential of it, it gets subject to fraud, abuse, hacks, badly written software. You know, I keep thinking to myself, you know, you could be a world class runner if you just stop tripping over your feet and hitting your face on the uh, on the track. And that seems to be what's been happening with crypto. And I'm hoping that we're going to get beyond that someday. Because in order for Bitcoin and Ethereum and the other tokens to have real value, in my mind, they need to have an ecosystem with them. And that's the DeFi ecosystem. And if we don't get any, look, Bitcoin's trying to create its own DeFi ecosystem, and that's fine too. It doesn't have to be the Ethereum ecosystem, although I do think the Ethereum ecosystem is superior right now. But as long as it, once you've got that going, I think then then this new alternative system can really take root. I still have hope for it. And I still am positive that they're going to get their act together on it. But yeah, it has stumbled out the gate. But if you look at the history of new technology, this is not new. A lot of new technologies do kind of fall on their face right away. And then they pick themselves up, dust themselves off, and then they kind of eventually get it correct and they you know, start making it onward. So I do like crypto. One last comment for crypto. The big story as we're discussing right now is, will there be a spot Bitcoin ETF? For everything I've seen, the answer is yes. They're going to have, the SEC is gonna have no choice but to approve a spot Bitcoin ETF. In fact, I've even gone on to say, they're not just gonna approve BlackRock's, that's what everybody thinks. They're gonna approve all of them because they did that with the Ethereum futures ETF two months ago. There's a gigantic first mover advantage in ETF land. So the SEC doesn't want to be accused of favoritism. So when they eventually said that they were going to approve an Ethereum futures ETF, they approved all nine of them that were under registration on the same day. And I think eventually they're going to do the same thing with the spot Bitcoin ETF. They're going to approve every single one of them on the same day or within 24 hours of each other. Who's going to win that best ticker or lowest cost? Well, that's really what's going to be you're, what we're talking about. Best ticker is who's got the best marketing plan or we're all just going to gravitate towards cost. And it seems like in Ethereum futures, it's a little bit of both. There's been a couple of I think it's Valkyrie that's been I might be wrong on it, but I think it's Valkyrie that's been uh, getting some traction because of their marketing and some of the others are because of lower cost. But what I worry about is, and I guess I'm stuck with, you know, being that if markets are somewhat mature, and this is like the most anticipated thing in the last year and a half, is the, the spot Bitcoin ETF is going to open it up so that regular people can just in their brokerage account finally buy, you know, Bitcoin straight up. You don't need a Coinbase wallet or any of the, or let alone go into DeFi and try and do it on Uniswap through a MetaMask account, if you know what I'm talking about, that's still complicated for the average person. I'm afraid that when I look at the big rally in the markets and in anticipation of this, it's going to be the biggest sell the news event of the last year in crypto, that we're going to go to 40,000 when we announce it and everybody's going to say, see, here we go, right back to 20 is basically what I'm afraid of, is it'll be the next step on that. If I could give you one quick uh, analogy on this, I'll never forget the day that Facebook came public in 2012. I was interviewed on uh, CNBC that day, not about Facebook. It had nothing to do with Facebook. 
But off camera, one of the personalities asked me, what do you think about Facebook? And then before I got a chance to answer, she asked me, what day do you think it'll hit $100? Now, remember, it came public in like the mid-20s or something like that. And, uh, you know, I kind of demurred. And I said, I, I kind of like it. I have no idea when it's going to hit $100. Well, Facebook came out in the mid-20s, and the first move was straight down to 11 You know, you lost two-thirds of your money on Facebook. And then eventually it went to $100. And, you know, all the, and then I remember after the fact, people said, see, I told you it was going to go to $100. Yeah, well, you lost two-thirds of your money first. And I'd be surprised if you held all the way through that entire drawdown before it eventually worked its way out. And I have a feeling that, all the bullish stories about the Bitcoin spot ETF might work out. Oh, it's going to take us to $100,000. Yes, it might. But the first move might be from 40 to 15. And then it'll shake everybody out. And then it'll then it'll climb that wall of worry to $100,000. So those are kind of some of the thoughts that I've had about uh, crypto in general. Yeah, I'm really curious to see where these ETF providers come out as far as management fees. You know, I have a joke. I say so much of fintech over the past 20 years has just been Vanguard but with higher fees, a nicer user experience and a prettier front end, but still higher fees. And so if I was one of these shops, if there's gonna be nine of you, I, I don't like, I'm guessing they all come out at 50, 75, 90. I would hope in crypto thus far, the fact you can't really get a market cap index that easily for 25 basis points or 10, that's gonna be fun to watch as this industry matures. Will any of them do that? I doubt it, but I would love to see that. And keep in mind, too, that, you know, crypto, especially Bitcoin, it's got like five or six times the volatility of the S&P. So if you're going to roll out a 50 basis point product with that level of volatility, the fee is a rounding error. And marketing might be the thing that wins it because the narrative around the Bitcoin spot ETF is the BlackRock filing for a spot ETF. So it's almost like, wait a minute, there's like eight others out there that are going to come on the same day, but everybody might just gravitate to BlackRock because that's just the way that they think about it, that it's it's BlackRock that's doing all this. It's Larry Fink that's been pushing this, you know? And so therefore of this myriad of, op of uh, options I have, I'll just go to the BlackRock one, even if they all come out on the same day. But we'll have to see, you know, I assume that that's what this SEC would do, because if the SEC only approved BlackRock and gave them like a two week head start, if they only approve BlackRock and give them a two week head start before they approve all the others, they're going to have to answer questions about favoritism or corruption or because, like I said, they know as well as I know, as well as you know, that the first mover advantage is so important. That's why I think they'll give it green light to all of them on the same day. And then we'll just watch the scrum from there. Yeah, it'll be fun to watch. Like you said, you, when you describe yourself as a fan, I have a 2013 tweet talking about the spot Bitcoin ETF not making out by year end. I don't think it makes it out this year, but 2024 is finally my sushi dinner party when this finally gets approved. The SEC is running out of excuses for not doing it because they keep losing in court. You know, now the Grayscale Trust, which is a closed end fund, is going to be allowed to convert and the SEC is not going to appeal it. So they're they're running out of, out of reasons to deny it. They So all they've got left is delay. And you're very well right. With six weeks left in the year, it'll probably be a 24 story. Two more quick questions, because I would love we're going to def definitely have to have you back on because, again, you're one of my favorite people to listen to. What's something that you believe today, or this could just be a framework, doesn't have to be this moment in time, but it could be, but it could also just be a framework belief that most of your peers or our peers don't wouldn't agree with. So if we went and sat down at a dinner here in LA or Chicago and you said, okay, hey, what do you guys think about this? Most of the table would just shake their head, say, no, that's crazy. I don't agree with you on that. What do you got? Anything come to mind? Politics doesn't matter as much for financial markets as we like to think. We could sit down at dinner and we could probably fight about, you know, the 24 election. We could fight about what's going to happen in the Middle East. We could fight about, you know, some of the cultural issues of the day that we uh, all have opinions about, but are afraid to talk about them. And we would then try to frame that as, well, if this guy wins the election and you could fill in the blank as to who that guy is, the stock market will go up or down, or this guy's more bullish for the stock market. And we're going to get all these stories next year. 
if Trump wins or the Republican wins, these are the sectors you're going to buy. This is what the stock market is going to be. If Biden wins or the Democrats win, these are the sectors you're supposed to buy. This is what the stock market is going to do. I think we way overstated. I don't think it matters nearly as much as people do that this, this is why we get confounded all the time in the economy. And we have this self, self-selection on this stuff. And I'll give you what I mean by the self-selection. If you look at the University of Michigan Consumer Confidence Survey and you break it down as to what is the single biggest driver between people that have a positive or negative outlook in the economy, is it income? Is it race? Is it net worth? Is it geographic location? Is it do you own your home? It's not. It's are you Republican or Democrat? In other words, but that doesn't have anything to do with it. You know, it's like, here's the economy, a Republican wins, in this, and now all of a sudden all the Republicans are bullish and all the Democrats are bearish. A Democrat wins and it flips. That tells me that it's completely irrational, is what it is. And so I would argue to you that, yeah, I'd be more than willing at, over a couple of glasses of wine and a cocktail to, you know, talk about politics with somebody. But if you want to drag in, so therefore the stock market will do X if this guy wins or Y, that guy wins. I don't think it matters as much as people want to believe it does. I've long thought that. My favorite take, though, was that, you know, the number one indicator on who's going to win the election is like the stock market performance. I forget if it's the year leading up to it, the election, but it has an extremely high hit rate on if the market's up, the incumbent party stays in power. And if it's down, they get booted. And we were saying when Trump got elected, I said, Hillary needs to start buying futures because she's going to be in trouble if this market continues. But I didn't place any bets on the political uh, futures or anything else. I, I probably should have. If you remember the night of the election in 2016, the night that Trump was declared the victor, S&P futures were down 5% overnight. And Paul Krugman famously tweeted out that the stock market was down 5% overnight and that this was the start of the Great Depression. Well, it bottomed about five minutes later and then went up for the next year and a half. I think we actually had like 14 or 15 consecutive up months right after that. I think it was the longest period in history of consecutive up months, which, you know, I don't think anybody would have predicted. And it came right off the Krugman tweet. Remember, he's a professional. Do not attempt to to, uh, make contrarian calls like him at home. Yeah. Last question. Do you have a most memorable investment? And it could be also a call or just a research piece, but something that is kind of seared in your brain, good, bad in between. I'm going to go give you a slightly different answer. So I'm a macro guy and I've been doing this for a while. So in the late 90s and the early 2000s, I did diverge a little bit and I started talking about specific securities. And the specific securities that I was really talking about and panning at the time was Fannie and Freddie. And talking about the amount of duration risk that they were taking in their portfolio, the convexity trade that they were doing, and I thought that it posed a lot of risk for them. And I was writing about it, and I was interviewed on TV about it and the like. And the reason I bring that up is This was like one of the few forays that Mr. Macro and me kind of went into individual securities. I then, in the middle of that, caught somebody going through my garbage, and it turned out to be a private investigator for Fannie Mae looking for dirt on me. And I was like, man, this is the first and last time I'm ever going to go into individual securities again on that kind of stuff. And they never were really brutal on me, but I think... He wanted me to catch him to kind of send a message. And, you know, so you hear these stories about when you pan companies like this, that they could be very, very aggressive against, you know, influential voices about that. And maybe they won and you could argue they won. But I've decided that I want to stay in my lane of 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 macro. I'm not ready to do like David Einhorn has done. He's written whole books about allied financial and stuff like that and about the horror stories that he's gone through in that. And I read that book about the same time. I was like, man, I I just don't want to go through this. So you got to be a certain type. Right. Mark Cahotis, you know, is another name that comes to mind that you've really got to have a real mentality to want to do that. And I floated into it just because I was talking about it was a natural. 
as a bond guy, it's a natural offshoot to just start looking at their portfolio and the convexity in the portfolio and the duration and the type of trades that they were doing and saying, you know, this isn't adding up. But to me, it was a bond call. And I never really said short the stock or anything like that. I was just saying I had problems with that, with that whole business that they were in and they didn't like it and they didn't like it at all. And, uh, you know, and so that was kind of my experience. And I mean, we know now that, you know, they went into receivership in 2018 and they've been a ward of the government now for 15 years. And they're a very, very different company right now. Matter of fact, the chief economist of Fannie Mae right now is a good friend of mine, Doug Duncan. I love it. Jim, where's the best place people can find you? They want to follow your work. They want to sign up. They want to keep up to date with what you're doing. Where do they go? So I'm going to give you a new answer to this too. So how about this? You can follow me on, on Twitter at Bianco Research. You can follow me on LinkedIn under Jim Bianco. You can go check out our website at BiancoResearch.com. You can request a free trial if you want. And I'll throw in a new one for you. I'm an avid cyclist. You can follow me on Strava too. Sweet. Listeners, check it out. Jim, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.